Taylor, who's going to share some great advice. The subject of this week's show is advice for non-technical founders. Sometimes you get crazy lunatics like me who are non-technical, but they think they're technical and we can get ourselves into a lot of trouble. But there's a lot of other founders who aren't technical at all. And I think uh, in a world that feels so digitally enabled, this can be um, very intimidating uh, for a lot of people to get into the space and, and feel that they can go start uh, a, a technology enabled business. So we've got a, a really, really great uh, a guest today. Uh, Albert uh, is probably best known in the Miami tech scene for uh, being the founder of CareCloud, which had a, a very uh, notable exit. But he's also uh, was the CEO of Avicenna, another um, uh, revenue health, healthcare revenue management uh, company. Uh, he is uh, a generally good guy beyond someone I'm just starting to get to know now, and has got a great helpful energy about him. He's on the board of uh, Goodwill of South Florida, and most recently, uh, I've got to know him through the lens of his latest company or latest creation called Eight Base, which, funnily enough, actually has some great technology that makes starting a technology business a little less intimidating and a little easier, potentially for those non-technical uh, founders and entrepreneurs we just talked about. So there's gonna be a lot packed in today, a lot of great advice, and you're gonna get it from someone who you should definitely be listening to. That may not be me, but it's definitely Albert. So with that, welcome to this week's OSHIP. Freddie, it's great to Albert, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Freddie. It's great to be here. It's always good, always good to talk to you. I appreciate that. So, you know, today we got to hashtag the uh, the, the the post is Miami Tech. I, it's, I think the first uh, you know proper Miami uh, Tech person I've had on the show. I'm sure we'll get into that at at some point today. Um, you know, I want to make sure that uh, that any of the people tuning in today, or whether you're watching it live or or watching it later, understand a little bit more about your background and why you're a great person to take some guidance from. Uh, could you tell our audience a little bit about um, your experiences and your and your background? Yeah, sure. So probably the most important thing to know about me from a background perspective is I started my career as an engineer. So I studied computer engineering and was, was actively working professionally when I was eight, 18 years old. Uh, in the early days, uh, I was doing fintech, then later on healthcare IT, and then I joined a group of founders in 1997, including the partner in charge of KPMG Consulting, who had left the firm, raised $20 million of venture capital, started a company called Answer Think Consulting Group. Uh, we IPO'd, listed on the NASDAQ 11 months later, and while I was there for four years, I was doing management consulting, helping mostly large US-based companies with um, IT strategy, digital transformation. It was a great experience because I got to see a lot of world-class IT, a lot of uh, how large companies would, would do things. But I also got to see how do you take a company from zero to IPO in 11 months? <laughs> well, I was hooked, you know? So in, in 2001, I left the firm, started Avicenna with a group of co-founders. It was a terrifying experience because I had four young kids and a wife who was a school teacher at home. Um, and uh, you know, but got it done. Always felt like my calling was to be an entrepreneur. Successfully built the company, uh, raised angel investment, then venture capital, eventually exited. And in 2009, started CareCloud with about $2.8 million of angel, then $5 million the following year, then did a $20 million Series A led by Norwest and Intel Capital in 2011, which is probably the first Silicon Valley deal in Miami yeah. in at least 10 years prior. Successfully grew the company, stepped down from the day-to-day -day when we were at about 25 million in recurring revenue, um, stuck around for a while, and then uh, then started working on 8Base. And 8Base is really the culmination of all of that experience. And it was based on, you know, the companies that I found are typically based on a pain that I'm feeling. And the pain I was feeling was, how do you bring your digital, complex digital product to life without having to raise millions of dollars of venture capital give away control and ownership of your company and uh, help to, to solve for a successful financial exit at the end for a founder. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the ApeBase is a low code development platform, which basically means it's a tool set and a platform to help people 
um, accelerate the development of their digital products. Uh, I love that. And I think uh, um, a, lo a lot of people have never heard maybe the, the kind of low code expression before. Like we said, we'll, we'll get into that uh, more today. I love this, um, you know, before we kind of dig into this uh, a bit deeper, I, I love this sentiment that, you know, as a founder and as an entrepreneur, and which you're, you know, uh, absolutely a, a, a fellow serial entrepreneur, that you always go after, um, you know, this concept, you're solving pain points that, um, you know, that, that, affect you personally do you think that's something that everyone else should follow uh follow by or like you know that's a rule that other entrepreneurs should do or does it not really matter it's just your personal style i think it's a little bit of personal style but i think it's a good way to go because by it, by definition it means that you have some depth in the subject matter and it, it brings you close enough to the problem that you can design a product and a company to fix the problem so you know, entrepreneurship is all about eliminating risks and trying to maximize success. It is a risky endeavor to begin with. So if you know that there's a problem, you haven't been able to solve it through traditional methods and, uh, and you have a vision for how to fix it, I think that's a good recipe on how to start. Mm. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think that you know sometimes people argue we'll bring a fresh set of eyes to an industry or whatever. It could be great, but I have to be honest. Personally, I don't invest in anything that uh, is not an area that I know really well anymore. Every time I get excited about something, and I'm kind of uh, I use a geeky term here, a noob when it comes to it. I think I my enthusiasm outweighs my sense, and then yeah. uh, you know, I've got myself into trouble. And it's like, look, unless you're you know multi billionaire that can afford to just play wild cards all the time. Um, I think it's I think it's good advice and to get some of your passion about. And frankly, um, once once the novelty wears off and, and you're exhausted and you're tired and everything else that comes along with being an entrepreneur, um, it's nice when you love the thing that you're passionate about. You can probably get get through those those hard parts um, uh, a little easier. Um, yeah, but that's, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, you know, but that's the emotional side of being an entrepreneur. And I'd say that, you know, one of the bigger challenges, um, you know, people have now, and I know you and I both totally agree on this, is is the technical side of it. Because everything seems to be technology enabled now. Even if you're saying it's not a technology business, there's nothing that doesn't have tech in it now. Um, you know, what, what would you say uh, are some of the kind of most common problems you've seen, you know, non-technical founders run into after advising so many businesses yeah I would say problem number one is not being not building their product correctly either what the product does or how it's how it's architected um, how it's coded and the people decisions related to that you know selecting technical people is a very difficult thing especially for a non-technical founder mm -hmm. um, if you have a ready pool of people to choose from to begin with because you might not these people are in high demand. Um, the people who have done it before are generally gainfully employed or have a tremendous number of opportunities where they can get significant equity stakes in well-funded companies in addition to a good, you know, fair day's wage. Um, so the people decisions and the access to talent, which result in a well-built product in a timely manner for a reasonable cost, I would say is one of the biggest challenges that, that folks sort of uh, confront um, but there's a whole bunch of other ones and you alluded to some of these which are the emotional challenges you know it's like people are emotional beings startups are terrifying a lot of times they go into it with a vision of success that is supposed to happen a lot faster and a lot better and a lot of people don't lack you know they lack the, the ability to persevere I, I had to snicker a little bit when you said startups are terrifying by the way because I I immediately thought I was like I must be just a complete idiot because I just I'm, I'm too stupid to be scared because I, I run headlong into these things over and over and over again. I, I, you know, I sometimes joke being the world's biggest masochist, but I'm pretty sure there's a, a healthy level of bliss and ignorance for for some serial entrepreneurs who just you know don't don't feel the fear of it. Um, but yeah. you know. I, I, but I've seen it in a lot of people I talk to. By the way, I, I'm never scared before I start them. I get scared slightly after I do them. So eventually the, it does kick in, but it's uh, normally too late and I have to see it through. That's what right, right. <laughs> Look, I think, I think most, most people, first time entrepreneurs, if they really knew what they were getting into, they might not do it. I yeah. agree with that. A little bit of ignorance is bliss, uh, works well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, odd question for you. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways you could you could approach um, a, a technology product. Let, let's assume there's a hypothetical you're building an app or like a SaaS platform. Doesn't matter, you know, you know what it is, right? Um, you know, you, there was a lot of uh, talk, uh, you know, certainly in the last five to ten years, where it's like, hey, you could go out there and build, you know, dog food it, build some you know, MVP, do it, you know, build it in Google spreadsheets, whatever it is, you know, build the simplest, cheapest, fastest way to kind of prototype something and make it work. Um, or, you know, now with the, some of the newer things out there, like, you know, like even 8Base, you know, are you better off like skipping that stage now and, and maybe using a low code approach to to build a, an early prototype of a product because I'm not sure those rules apply anymore. Yeah, so I, I think that you always want to run as lean as possible and you want to try to get as much proof that your idea is going to work before you invest big into it. But the challenge with that, and it, it really depends on the type of startup, what MVP means to, let's say, a consumer startup, mm -hmm versus what MVP means to, um, you know, some sort of uh, B2B startup or, or even, you know, let's say it was in healthcare or financial services um, is very, very different. So it really means minimum viable in terms of features and what a customer, customer will validate and buy, as opposed to, um, you know, flimsy, inflexible, uh, eventually needs to be rebuilt product. So the way we like to think about it is, Always try to figure out what's the minimum viable features, but do not skimp on architecture. Yeah, that makes, it, it uh, makes sense. Uh, uh, I uh, yeah, I get the sense that uh, you know I, I've certainly built some things where I think it's like you know you build into it and it's kind of like a throwaway. In fact, I can think of multiple instances where I've done like multiple generations of almost throwaway products and wanted to start over and over again. But I I, I um. I, I just feel like now with some of these new systems, it's so easy to build on these like ultra scalable uh, platforms. Um, you know, whether it's things like uh, Eight Base or even uh, AWS, uh, you know, Amplify or, or, or you know, some you know similar type of, of things um, that you know you just it's like a, a rocket ship to a more advanced product. Um, and so, you know, if you had a um, a technical founder who you know, you're giving advice to right now, let's assume there's at least, you know, or sorry, non-technical founder who I'm sure there's you know, at least one going to end up watching this video. Um, is, is there any advice that you would give them if they you know, hadn't even raised money, they were at you know, you're, you know, day one or certainly you know, first couple months of this, um, any advice you'd try and give them to, to give them a good, a good start? Freddie, I'm sorry, I lost you there for a second. What was? Uh, could you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah, I, I was just saying that if you know, if you've got a um, a non-technical founder who's kind of listening in right now, and they've got an idea, but they haven't got much further than that, is there any advice that you would uh, give them to get you know to get started at this point? Yeah, I would say, look, first of all, be certain that this is what you want to do. Uh, research the space. Try to put together a, a, a you know prototype of your of your product to be able to validate with potential customers. Get as much input on the idea before you spend the next few years of your life trying to make something successful. That would be the number one advice I would give somebody. And, and sometimes sometimes you find entrepreneurs that leave a venture, leave a company, are well armed with knowledge of the market, knowledge of the the, the problem space know exactly what they want to build and they can skip a lot of those steps. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about on the show many times in the past, um, or it's been a theme that's kind of come up is this, this, this democratization of access to technology. Basically there's things uh, out there. I, I, but I think there's like an imaginary, I don't think it's on either of our feeds. So I'm not sure where it's coming from, but anyway, um, uh, so uh, it's o, o, o ship in, in motion as as usual, but um, going on. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, so the, the joy of live broadcast. So the you know this kind of access to the democratization of, of of technology, where things that you and I may have done ten years ago or fifteen years ago, where it just took incredible amounts of resources to get that done. Now there may be some you know. 
API platform that you can sign up to for $9 and 95 cents a month yeah. or something and pay on a pro use space, just stuff that would be unfathomable would have been like game changing tech. And it's just so cheap and so accessible, or, you know, even on the most basic level, people that want to go out there and, you know, start incredible e-commerce sites. I mean, e-commerce is so cheap and easy to get into. Um, you know, I, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, this kind of shift is, is, you know, almost kind of bolting all these different things together, uh, it, you know, is, is an absolute paradigm shift for, 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 uh, new entrepreneurs. Um, do you think that, you know, but do you still need a tech guy on the team or do you think you can out, you know, can you outsource that now? Or do you think if you're a non-technical founder, do you still think you should have a, a, a technical co-founder or is it you know, not, 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 not totally essential, I guess. It depends. It depends on the type of venture. And, um, you know, what is a technical co-founder to a start to a non-technical founder? Is it, a, is it the chief coder? Is it a leader? Is it somebody who can who can hire the right people and manage them? Is it an architect? Mm -hmm. um, you know, oftentimes, as I'm sure you've seen, this gets mislabeled. You know, engineer number one becomes a CTO. They come in with very limited uh, managerial experience, and then they peter out. They become more of an individual contributor, can't hire other people, can't manage them to success. Mm -hmm. Your typical, you know, bootstrap startup, which is by and large the majority these days, doesn't have the resources to attract the best and the best CTO, the best of the best, uh, which is truly a person who can lead and, and manage, you know, people, hire them, manage them to success. Besides the fact that the minute you get into that, you, know, you may be talking about millions of dollars of investment, whereas a bootstrap startup probably needs to build their product for a quarter million dollars or less. Mm. And so I would always, at this point in time, I would look to externals, for the typical startup that can help fill the role of the CTO and help build a product uh, that is well built, built based on many, many iterations of having built some similar products and they can bring that expertise to your venture. Um, if you have millions of dollars of capital from the get-go, that's a different story. But mo again, most people don't have that. Um, yeah. One thing you just touched on, I think, is really interesting, and and this is when I think about um, mistakes that I see other entrepreneurs make. This is probably one of the most common, and and it's one of the hardest to walk back. And that is that um, they you know, you've got certain people, like you said, it could be a technical person. A lot of times, those people become your friends, very dear friends, when they're in the trenches yeah. with you, the early stages of these businesses, and the company outgrows them, you know, or certainly outgrows the role. You know, you feel yeah. a sense of indebtedness and loyalty to them. And those are good things, you know, that you, uh, those are great human qualities and you want to see them go along for the ride. And you feel like because they were first, they should be the most senior. Uh, but then they, they don't have the necessary skill sets. You know, you hear a lot about people being great from taking you, let's say from zero to 5 million in revenue, but maybe the same people are going from five to 25 and 25 to a hundred and a hundred and beyond. Um, you, you know, have you had any kind of uh, situations like that in your own past that you've, you've had to, had to deal with where, you know, maybe you know, it created complicated situations. You both, both probably personally and professionally um, for those kind of reasons. I would say if there's been a situation, I've lived it when it comes to this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, lived, I've lived with situations where co-founders weren't pulling their weight. I've had situations where I've had early team members that, you know, uh, gave their blood to make the company successful that just could not scale. Um, and I've had situations where I thought the person could scale and I've had board members, VCs, um, you know, insisting that they weren't the right people. Sometimes they got that right. Sometimes they got that wrong. Um, so, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of different situations. You've got to, I've always tried to be very honest with people about the requirements of the job today and what it'll take to, to do the job tomorrow as best I could see it and tried to calibrate the person's ambition for being in a larger role back to sort of what their capabilities are today and try to try to help prop them up as best I can along the way. All of that, given that when you're an entrepreneur, especially at the early stage, you're not really a pure manager. You're probably wearing many, many hats. 
and you're probably ne neglecting some of your managerial and uh, people cultivation sort of responsibilities. But, but nonetheless, you know, at least my position on all this has always been that these companies are really made by people. They're not made by me alone. They're not made by uh, the investors alone either. It's really um, a labor of love from the people that are working there every day. Yes, they're getting paid, but it takes more than just, you know, clocking in nine to five to make a startup successful. So it usually has an emotional element for these people uh, as well. Yeah, I'm actually being treat. Um, I have uh, in, in, throughout my career a, a huge chunk of my really close friends uh, either started out working for me and or with me and then became, in most cases, working for me and then becoming really, really good friends of mine. Or I've got a, a, people on the other side of it where, um, you know, they were great friends and then ended up working uh, for me or with me kind of kind of later in life. Um, did that happen to you as well? I, I feel like my, my, my friendships and my business world are very intertwined and that could be a bit dangerous uh, at times. Yeah, yeah, I think... I've gotten, believe it or not, as I've gotten older, I've gotten less worried about, um, you know, working with friends yeah. in, in, in general. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable that I'm pulling my weight and, you know, people generally know what it means to, to sort of work with me. Um, and if they're a competent friend that's got the same alignment as me, I have no real issue with it. Yeah. Um, but that said, I haven't found a lot of people like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the key... Um, is to set really, really, really clear expectations. Yeah. And, and if you can just avoid misunderstandings, that way if anything does go wrong, you can always go back and say, look, I you know, I hammered this home at the beginning that if you, we were gonna, this was gonna be great as long as these couple things happen. And then it makes it kind of, hopefully if they have some level of self-awareness, uh, <laughs> then they'll kind of go, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. we didn't quite really get there. And, and then there tends to be not that many hard feelings. But I have had some situations over the years where I've had to fire some really close, like like borderline you know, childhood type friends. And it's- Yeah, been, yeah, it's, no, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a very common thing. What, what I've learned to do, Freddie, is, is number one, you know, entrepreneurs are always in a hurry and I, I'm always in a hurry, but I've learned to slow down on the people decisions Try to really be sure that the person is the right person. You're still going to make mistakes, but you're going to make less of them. And uh, and that that has led me to be just much more successful in terms of getting the results and not having turnover. Um, but then also when you when you figure out that somebody is not the right person, and I've still got some growth on this one, but um, you know, act quickly. Uh, because it, you know, once your gut is telling you they're not the right person, it's probably you're probably right. And uh, but but at the same time, try to you know treat people with a lot of dignity, so that the relate as if you're going to hire them again, um, so that you know you don't burn bridges and you do right by people and and, and you do right by the culture. You know, for for me, certainly listening to you now, and anyone who I'm sure is listening in. You know, it's, it's clear you've uh, got an incredible technology background. You're clearly an incredible business guy. But I think there's a little bit of a, a philosopher and a, a very thoughtful chap, uh, you know, in you and how you look at the world. Uh, had you not gone the profession you did now, is there some other path you would have gone down as a you know, different different career? <laughs> well, uh, there's there's two things I would have liked to have been, but I wouldn't dare to have tried because I'm just not good enough. But one of them would be a professional baseball player. Another one would be a lead singer in a rock band. And that one is definitely not qualified to be. But, um, I actually, when I went to college, I actually got accepted uh, as an architect. And uh, I changed my mind because, at the advice of a few people uh, right before I started and switched it to computer engineering. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a technical side to me and there's a creative side to me. But the way it sort of worked out is that I've gotten to take the creative side, which would have been applied in architecture, and applied that to the design of digital products and, and the creation of startups, um, which I think is probably, at the end of the day, uh, more suitable for me. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that I made that choice. But uh, had I not done it, I probably would have headed down the architecture path. Cool. I, I could see how that could like fire off some of your, uh, you know, fire off some of the endorphins that you, you crave. Uh, very serious question, though. If you had been a rock band, a lead singer of a rock band, 
which rock star would you have been? Oh I my would, God. I, I would have been Dave Gahan from Depeche Mode. That's, that would have been my dream rock star persona. <laughs> you know, the one that comes to mind, since you caught me off guard, comes to mind immediately would have been like David Lee Roth from Van Halen. Yeah, yeah that would have been fun. <laughs> that, would have been, that, would have been, that would have been a good rock star life to live. I, I, I'm back up on that one. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, if someone was to go out there and, uh, you know, I guess try and recreate some of the, the you know, things that you've done at this point or they wanted a similar career path to you, this kind of uh, 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 half business, half tech, very part, part warrior philosopher monk. Uh, what, 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 what advice would you give, you know, uh, a young you know, 20, early 20 something person, you know, to try and maybe follow in some of the footsteps you've been in? The first one is I would tell them that this is not what it seems on on its face. Entrepreneurship is not it's not glamorous. Um, it's made out to be glamorous. You know, there's lots of sort of hip, hipster culture, for lack of a better word, around entrepreneurship. Um, my belief is that entrepreneurship is primarily a heads down, very uh, emotionally challenging, and uh, type of profession that yes, there can be a lot of glory. Sometimes that glory is misdirected, mm. but uh, the glory comes after you actually achieve the results that you need to achieve. Mm. Uh, if you're trying to capture the glory or celebrate too early, um, that generally doesn't lead to good things. Mm. And uh, not a big are you ready, to, are you ready yeah. to start for that? You know? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of fake it till you make it kind of entrepreneur stuff. I really feel like it was bred by you know, people craving coverage and tech crunch or venture beat or whatever. And, and it was a lot, there's a lot of fake fakery or whatever the correct term would be out there. I love that though. This is not as not as it seems. Um, I couldn't agree with that more. I think, you know, people see maybe um, see some of the positive sides of what a, a good outcome can be. You see someone that looks like success from the outside, but there are a lot of crazy sacrifices that are made along the way, yeah. you know, I mean, it's not uncommon for me to work from seven in the morning to you know ten p.m. at night or later, you know, uh, you know, multiple times a week. Sometimes that might even go on for weeks on end if we're knee deep in something. And people always forget that uh, uh, old ship rolls upwards. <laughs> so, so you know, a huge chunk of what you're doing is the least fun stuff that no one else wants to deal with or can deal with. Um, because you're you're doing a lot of crisis resolution. That yeah. could be really interesting. You know, I'm 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 23 years old. I look like hell. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so, but it but it's it's re it's really stressful, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. I, I love that. It's not what it seems. Yeah. If people just see they see the tech crunch version of entrepreneurship, but not the uh, I think the real the real side of it. That that's great. Um, I think I think a good example of, of that is sort of like, so you raise ten million dollars for your venture or twenty million dollars for your venture. How do you feel when that happens? It's are you are you really excited about all the attaboys you're gonna get, or is it I just got diluted? I just got new people that I don't really know on my board. There's a whole bunch of new expectations for me. Um, I have a bigger hurdle I have to hit to achieve financial success for everyone, including myself, right? So if you don't have that decent a, a dose of humility around, hey, this is a big responsibility and you're just all about the attaboys, because the press is gonna make you look good, people are gonna think you're, you're wonderful, but there's a whole other side to that that you have to be cognizant of. And I, I just see, especially with so much capital flowing in the world, I see way too much of the of the behavior you know related to celebrating and you know not not being heads down and driving a result from from the new infusion of capital i'm intrigued you you used the term heads down uh, a couple times were you a good student or a bad student is this like a lifelong concept of heads <laughs> down or you know i was a i was a pretty good student but not necessarily because i was heads down all the time you know i had, I had a pretty decent, you know, social life outside of that. Yeah. But, uh, but no, I was a good student, you know, I was, I was good enough. God, I was a nightmare. It's a miracle. <laughs> <I'm not bad. laughs> 
<laughs> it's, it's, I'm pretty sure if I went back in time, half my half my uh, teachers probably would have told I'd be working in a gas station or something. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was like I had to get out get out of school to get really 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 serious about uh, having like a hardcore work ethic. My my only my only uh, my only thing I was very consistent about in high school and uh, and, and uh, was uh, making sure I had a lot of fun. But I was very very good at that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so. I made sure I made sure I had enough fun while still you know pulling off a decent uh, education, you know, grade and yeah. so forth. But yeah, okay. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't what, for the grades. Yeah, I, I think um, you know what, one of the things I think is so interesting about um, your story, and, and you and I have you know, dug into it deeper you know, uh, in, in our co personal conversations. But you know, the, the like the, the doing the IPO in like eleven months is totally insane. Uh, for the record, I, mean, I, I always kind of giggle every time you talk about that. I mean, it just sounds totally totally nuts. I, um, and I, and that one I can't take personal credit for. I was there. But, yeah, I understand. But just, just even being on that journey, and I appreciate the yeah. disclaimer. I mean, it's still still crazy. What, what do you think of all these new, uh, you know, special purpose uh, acquisition kind of you know, vehicle uh, where people are raising money, the SPAC or whatever yeah. they call them? I, I, you know, SPACs have been around for a long, long time. They become in vogue now. I think there's a real danger of a bubble um, because a lot of times the underlying assets that are being brought into the public shell or, or just not ready to be public company. Um, so I, I think there's a bubble there. I don't know that there's much, much more to say about it. And like any bubble, there would be people that, that do really well economically and there'll be people that do really poorly. I don't know that the bubble is big enough to affect the overall economy like the dot-com bubble did or the real estate bubble did. Um, so I'm not that worried about the general economy. But, you know, I do worry about the people that are in the SPACs, for sure. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of, like, you know, when they're doing it again with, like, you know, raising all that money in, in, in through, uh, you know, crypto, blockchain. It's like people are always trying to find some way to get around. They go raise all this money and, and, and kind of not follow the conventional rules. And, and, um, and, and you know, speed is wonderful for them. And I'm sure with the great companies, I think that's, that's great that they can get there faster. But it is a little scary that... I think it kind of pulls off some of the guardrails that may be there, yeah. and that and that could be dangerous for for you know for some folks potentially. But hey, you know, for the entrepreneurs out there, if they're playing it off and building great businesses, uh, three three cheers for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and if you're an entrepreneur selling into them, you know, you're betting the farm for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's got to work. If it doesn't work, it's going to be really hard to bounce back from that. Yeah. And and you know, the other thing I'd love to get your take on. Uh, yeah, Miami Tech. You've been down here doing this for a long time. I feel like I've been down here doing this for a long time, but always, you know, kept kept my, for a guy with a big mouth. I've kept to myself for a lot of it. You know, what what uh, what's your what's your take on on you know where Miami's technology and and kind of almost like startup scene is going to go over the next couple of years? Yeah, so I'm I'm you know I'm I'm really excited about what's happening. I think the mayor uh, has done a great job to catalyze things. Uh, I think we needed that. You know, I, I was one of the one of the people doing Miami Tech before it was really a thing. Uh, it was never easy. It was probably twice as hard to raise money from institutional investors for sure. I think you're being very kind and twice as hard. Try like fifty times as hard. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I don't, don't want to overstate. You know, I don't want to overstate. You know, I've been able to do it right. So I've been able to get institutional money, Silicon Valley money, even at that. And I've been able to raise a lot of angel money. Um, right. so I would say the angel scene here is robust. There's a lot of high net worth individuals. There isn't really organized angel groups. There's a few. But when I was raising money, there weren't really. And, um, you know, it makes for a, for a vibrant environment. But uh, yet not everybody can access that pool of investor. Um, mm -hmm. But attracting institutional money to Miami's group has, has always been really, really difficult. So, yeah, yeah not that I want to, you know, there's, a, I always put this disclaimer out. There's a lot of incredibly tragic implications of COVID and beyond all the, you know, the insane death toll that's taken on the United States. But there has been this acceleration of other parts of, uh, of our culture and society from, from digital transformation to remote working, et cetera. Would you argue that um, COVID and what happened in terms of remote working may have accelerated uh, Miami Tech or, or yes, no. You I, know, think, I, yeah. I think it's like it's it more. in an enormous way. 
Yeah. yeah. To me, to me, it has for a lot of different reasons, you know, remote work in the sense that living in Miami is amazing. Right. So I'd rather live here than any place in the world, which is why I live here. But uh, and always have. But truthfully, I think that's, you know, a lot of people feel that way. So remote work in itself has helped. The, you know, you add to that the fact that uh, each state has sort of their own implications, their own guidelines around, you know, being open for business or not. And so Florida uh, and Texas have, you know, made a lot of inroads partially because they are open for business. Mm. And so then you add everything else, you know, no local and state tax. Um, generally speaking, we're a vibrant entrepreneurial community. Uh, and there's a lot of money, you know, put all that together. And uh, it's, it's, you know, the mayor, um, if he's the one who really kicked this thing off, you know, brilliant execution or brilliant luck, one or the other, he sort of, you know, said the right things at the right time. And that's really made, uh, made it all take off in this way. I'm, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people relocate from tech, from New York and California. A lot of the right people that have built, you know, successful ventures in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley or in, in the Northeast. And my hope is that they bring real sort of, uh, you know, they bring their businesses here. They start their next ventures here. Uh, they invest in entrepreneurs that are down here. But at the end of the day, you know, we, uh, we got to realize who we are and where we are. And we are not Silicon Valley. I don't believe we ever will be. I don't believe we should try to be. Yeah, I agree. I don't think we want to. Be. I don't know. Sure, we want to be at this point. Maybe no. we did five years ago, but I think we've started to find our own footing now. Um, you know, and it's it's kind of beautiful to watch. Yeah. I look. I don't think anyone should necessarily strive to be. Let let Silicon Valley be the place where core innovation happens. Mm -hmm. I like to borrow from sort of the Austin, Texas model. I think they've done a brilliant job mm -hmm. of knowing who they are and then leveraging that to uh, essentially you know, really, really propel their tech ecosystem. I wouldn't even try to, you know, another place that's done well is Boston, and then you got New York. I don't think we have the characteristics to be Boston or New York, but we can certainly borrow from Austin, Texas's playbook. And what I would argue is, you know, people would say is, is Miami, Miami and Austin are like neck and neck. I don't believe that. I believe Austin is pretty fairly, you know, fairly well ahead of us. And I've spent some significant time there. It doesn't mean we can't catch up and we can't surpass. It doesn't even mean we should be in competition with them. Mm -hmm. But we've got to stay grounded in the fact that Miami has not arrived. Um, we still have a lot of building that we have to do. But if we do it, we're going to be in great shape. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, um, I, I think that one, for me, one of the biggest things is actually just, um, you know, like you said, the, a lot of the New Yorkers and the uh, Californians moving down this way. Um, I think just a lot of people who were I used to you know, get this cracks and jokes and when raising money in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, years ago, like those you know who would wonder if any of us were working down here. Now, mind you, this was eight, eight, nine years ago. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, they're, they're coming down here and they're realizing it's an awesome place to work. I was just catching up yeah. with another New Yorker yesterday who came down because of COVID. And it's like, I don't I'm never going to go back. This is awesome. And they're, and and they're realizing that you don't that the network was never the physical place. Right. You know what I mean? It was never the physical place. And, and, and I think, you know, now physicality is becoming less and less and less um, important, you know? So um, it could have been the yeah. best thing that ever happened to us. So um, yeah, I, I, could, I couldn't be more excited about it. Um, well, look, you know, this, this was great, Edward. I'm so glad you, you got a chance to, to come on our ship and, and uh, give us some of your time today. Uh, you know, I know a lot of a lot of people out there really admire all the things you've been doing, um, you know, getting a chance to give some advice to some new entrepreneurs that are out there is, is always great. Uh, in, the, in the next couple months of OSHIP, I'm going to start doing some like four way OSHIP panels and see if I can screw those up live on the air, which should be fun. Um, but uh, but uh, I'm definitely going to bring you back for one of those. But um, I just want to say thanks again for, for coming. And, um, you know, for any of you who. Uh, or tuning in now, whether you're watching this live or watching this, uh, you know, uh, post the show being live, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, you know, the best thing you can do to support the show is give it a like, give it a share. Uh, it's just a couple of clicks for you, but means a lot to us. This is not something we do for profit. Uh, it's just something we do for fun. And we love uh, bringing all these really inspirational people um, uh, and hoping they impact your life in some 
some kind of positive uh, way. Um, if you haven't checked out 8Base, definitely uh, give them a quick Google and look up the, the product. I got a demo of it the other day. It's really, really impressive. Um, and they've got, um, not only are they doing actually a, a, a low code platform that allows you to rapidly develop um, all different types of applications, but they've got an entire service layer of programmers and developers and, and, and designers and product designers so that, um, you know, Albert's company uh, can basically help you massively accelerate the development of these products um, and not just feel like you've got to go work with their platform. And, and frankly, I'm even trying to figure out some ways where we could work together because I think it was, I was so impressed with it. Um, so there's a, a, it's not, a, a live shout out for you, Albert, but it's true. It's, it's really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Get, get a demo if you can. Um, so, Albert, any, any final words of advice or wisdom? Final words. So, yeah, I would say, look, if you're a non-technical founder, a uh, couple things. Number one, life is too short. So if you've got a vision, you feel passionate about it, do it. You really don't have that much to lose. But on the flip side, make sure you know what you're doing and try to Try to remove as many risks as you can every single day. And technically, you could lose a lot of hair. That's what happened to me. But, you know. Relevant to fix that, too. <laughs> Albert, thank you so much for coming on our ship. Everyone who's been watching, thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Did it. Take care.